But I have a sermon from Reverend Ann Mason that is um, a subject I would have brought to you anyway. It's about moving from church that is about us to church that's a, the individual, from church that is we. And it's, grant, it's grounded down in our transcendentalist history. And it fits well with the January theme, which is liberating love, which I've been trying to think of liberating as a verb that it's, um, we're liberating love as opposed to having it be a descriptive phase. It's an action. So there are readings within the sermon itself. So Reverend Ann Mason starts out talking about when she had moved to New, New England. She said, I was so excited to be in the cradle of the transcendentalists. Writers such as Alcott, Emerson, and Thoreau have been fundamentally important to the development of Unitarian philosophy. And, th and over the years, it has been so exciting to, to experience that thought, to see how they've developed over the years. I know that some people in New England regularly swim in Walden Pond. What a treasure. <laughs> how many of you have actually been there? Oh, lovely. I have not, but it's on my bucket list. Emerson's Divinity School Address of 1838 remains for me a seminal text, inviting us to use our own intuition and experience to connect with what we think of as the divine. I love this exploration of Eastern religious thought, which encourages us to seek the divine within ourselves instead of out there in a remote universe. And yet, there are residual philosophies contained within our own Unitarian Universalism, which come directly from these writers, which now, in our current context, give me pause. Well, more than pause. Heebie-jeebies. <laughs> this morning, says Reverend Mason, I would like to compare some of these historic perspectives with current writers who are black, queer, and emergent. Quite a contrast, but stay with me. In my lived experiences of Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance, has been a foundational text for many Unitarians. I know because I've been asked to read quotes from it, even at a memorial service. Try on this quote, Mason asks of us. To believe your own thought to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius." Unquote. Maybe good at first reading, right? I love the first part about believing in your own thoughts. However, we need encouragement to lift above the crowd, to listen to our own hearts, and to trust ourselves. But the second part, in light of all the anti-racism work we're doing, asks us to never assume that my truth will be the same from one person to another cultural perspective. It makes me see Emerson's writing in a new light. As I read this, my hackles began to rise. How can I speak for all people as a white cisgendered woman? I can't even speak for all white cisgender women let alone queer women or men of color. Now I understand that the context of Emerson's essay, written in 1841, was much more different than our world today. It was the height of the American Romantic Movement. But let me get at this total self-focus of Emerson's his definition of worth. It is not the good of the community, but the needs of the individual, which requires strength of will, according to Emerson. Quoting Emerson, whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness, but must explore if it be goodness. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Mason is appalled. 
She says, yes, of course I believe integrity of my own thought. It's a crucial piece of my own self-development and my own individual progress. But to say that nothing is sacred but my own mind seems to exalt the individual over the sacredness of anything else. She goes on to look at more of Emerson. No law can be sacred to me that is not of my nature. Good or bad, but names very readily transferable to this or that. The only right is what is after my constitution and wrong at what is against it. Mason says, well, does this define what's good for me to the extent that what is right for another has nothing to do with my, my concept of what is right? And are my individual needs and self-definition the arbiter of what is good for other people? This one is particularly disturbing, and this is in a rather famous essay of Emerson's. Then again, do not tell me, as a good man did today, of my obligation to put all poor men in good situations. Are they my poor? I tell thee, thou foolish philanthropist, that I grudge the dollar, the dime, the cent I give to such men as, I, as they do not belong to me and to whom I do not belong. I have to say, it really personally pains me <laughs> that this is someone we hold up in our Unitarian Universalist history who did write many other amazing things, but it's important to know this part about Emerson as well. So Mason says, I think that this philosophy is the very knife which sharpened the bootstraps we are all supposed to be wearing. <laughs> he separates people into the class of people to whom he wants to belong from those who don't belong to him. He absolves himself of all responsibility for those he does not respect. He exalts himself above the muck and the mire of humanity. I think he's engaged in one of man's oldest exercises of moral philosophy, that the search for a superior moral justification for selfishness, all in the name of individualism. So here, in a nutshell, is the beginning of our American adulation of individualism. I doubt it was the beginning, but a significant stepstone. It is the source of prioritization of the individual over collective responsibility, which has caused such a rift in our society. It's what continues to promote the gap between rich and poor. It's that which divides our Congress. It's also the start of what Frederick Muir has called the I Church. This comes from a Berry Street essay, and I wanna say for all of you who don't know what the Berry Street essay is, this is an annual essay in which someone presents for about 90 minutes, and then there's a panel that comments. It happens to be Unitarian, and it is, they believe it's the oldest running essay series in America at least the oldest recorded one. So it, it, um, it holds a lot of history within our faith in this very uh, easily trackable way. So Frederick Muir, in 2012, in the Berry Street essay, says, think of the I that is placed in front of the names of Apple products. Some say I means internet. Others explain that the I stands for individual. This is your personal piece of technology to be used for whatever purpose you want." End of quote. I think this individualism in technology leads people to see everything, including the church, as something only for their own personal growth, to be used whenever they want it, and to shape in their own image. It is our denomination that is so imbued with individualism. Do we have Emerson to thank for that? Are we the I church? I would say, are we sometimes the I church? <laughs> for two centuries, sympathetic observers from Thomas Jefferson to Harvard scholar and Bozeman native, 
Diana Eck, have said that Unitarian Universalism can be the religion of the future. Not that we are, but that we can be. Yet we still remain a fairly small religious minority in spite of a justice-seeking faith, in spite of the ministries in which we are committed, in, spart uh, in spite of the marketing we've done, we haven't grown. I will say we shrink a little at a little less rate than some other denominations, but we haven't grown. Mir holds that the thing which is holding us back the most is our adherence to individualism. He wrote, many of us were drawn to Unitarian Universalism because it seemed to be the church of Emersonian individualism. We are the I church. Mason says, I, I believe we're getting the error message. The I church app needs to get upgraded. What is our pathway to find inner connection as our faith tradition? I think the way through is to listen to the teachings of our younger leaders who ask us to engage in emergent strategies of collective work. Rather than seeing ourselves as lone individuals raging against the machine, they encourage us to develop linkages of trust to each other, to discover the joy of working together, to engage in activities of pleasure while embracing life itself. We need to discover that our humanity is bound up in each other. That we will progress to the extent that we work together for each other and not for ourselves alone. I wanna add, so this is not Mason speaking, this is me speaking. I think this congregation does a pretty good job with this. But I also think it is a daily practice. It's a daily reminder because it is so easy to be influenced by this I philosophy that goes on all around us and to never think we're immune to it. It's important to pause and make that part of our daily practice. Mason tells us to look to Archbishop Desmond Tutu and his sharing of this African concept of Ubuntu, she goes back to his 1980s speeches with Ubuntu meaning the essence of being human. Tutu says, particularly about the fact that you can't exist as a human being in isolation. It speaks about our inner connection. You can't be human all by yourself. And when you have this this quality, you are known for your generosity. We think of ourselves far too frequently as individuals separated from one another, whereas you are connected and what you do affects the whole world. And when you do it well, it spreads out for all of humanity. End of quote. So now for many, of, for not many of you, for a few of you, you know about this term, Ubuntu. It's a comp it is also on a computer program, which refer it is distributed by Lynx, and it's composed of free and open sourced software. And they call it, they use this word because it's to be shared freely with everyone. The company which manages it is called Canical, named after philosophy of I am what I am because of who we all are. That's on their lo underneath their logo. Bishop Tutu was a strong messenger of the philosophy. He says Africans believe that a person is a person through other people that my humanity is caught up, bound up, inextricably with yours. When I dehumanize you, I dehumanize myself. The solitary human being is a contradiction in, in terms, because in this philosophy. Therefore, you seek to work for a common good because your humanity comes through when you do. It's also an antidote to isolation, and self-centered perspective. 
Mason also wants us to look at Adrian Marie Brown. How many of you actually know who she is? She's an activist, but she's kind of newer in terms of being published. So I, I would suspect most people don't know her, but she's really popping up in Unitarian circles as she's done a lot of writing in the last couple of years. So um, Adrian Marie Brown. And what Mason wants us for our reading this morning to have are these two readings. She's comparing Emerson to Adrian Marie Brown. They're both speaking about waves. Emerson says, society is a wave. The wave moves onward, but the water of which it is composed does not. The same particle does not rise from the valley to the ridge. Its unity is only phenomenal. The person who makes up a nation today, next year die, and their experience with them. I think that's kind of depressing, actually. <clears throat> but Adrienne Marie Brown talks about waves in a different way. She says, together we must move like waves. The waves are not the same over and over. Each one is unique and responsive. The goal is not to repeat each other's motion, but to respond in whatever way feels right. The waves we create are both continuous and a one-time occurrence. We must notice how it feels to be in a body, which is separate, aligned, and cohesive but it is critically connected. So Brown is talking about how we feel as much as what we think. And she stresses the way we move together, flocking like starlings, each aware of the motion of the other, always connected. Here the individual is affected by and has the effect upon the whole, emergent, interconnected, and beautiful. Adrienne Marie Brown implores us to place love at the center, love which is communal, focusing on each other, hoping to care for each other and break down barriers which have separated us for so long. She imagines a radical new way of being, asking, if love were the central practice of a new generation, of organizers and spiritual leaders, it would have a massive impact on what was considered organizing. If the goal was to increase the love rather than winning or dominating or having a constant opponent, I think we would actually imagine liberation from constant oppression. We would suddenly be seeing everything we do, everyone we meet, not through tactical eyes of fear and war, but through eyes of love. As I believe I mentioned last week several times, we're in an election year. <laughs> and we have got to develop our coping skills because it is so hard to watch what is going on around us. Mason concludes with, the future of our faith lies in finding ways to reduce our tendency to hold our own personal views, our own needs, our own concerns as the most important part of our faith community. If we can find our way to place love at the center instead of our individualism, we would become the radically inclusive and hospitable faith we dream about. I hope you will join me in exploring this within our church and our denomination, because it's a message we want to be part of. Amen. <laughs>